Well, hello, everyone. Um, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of Feed the Future and USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I welcome you to our webinar, 10 Years of AgriLinks, a Community Retrospective. I have to admit, I feel kind of like a sports announcer with the, the headphones on and everything like that. Hopefully, everyone can hear me uh, well. Uh, with that, I am your host and Friendly Neighborhood Strategy and Learning Advisor, Zachary Bakke, with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. Before we dive into the content, I would like to touch on two things. First, uh, I want to give a big shout out to Julie McCarty for all of her efforts in building and facilitating the AgriLinks webinar series. Julie started working on webinars, uh, AgriLinks webinars, by facilitating the first Feed the Future Monitoring System webinar. And she's been uh, an outstanding contributor and worker on this uh, ever since. Uh, I had the good fortune to have Julie as my colleague on the Bureau for Food Security Learning Team. Uh, and in the, the reorganization from the Bureau for Food Security to the Bureau uh, of Resilience and Food Security. Um, Julie now supports the Center for Nutrition on knowledge management activities and learning and uh, has moved away from the, the role on AgriLinks, but she uh, occasionally uh, is able to help us out and facilitate uh, these um, sessions uh, as we go along. So again, Really appreciate all the work that she's done, um, the efforts that she's led in really making AgriLinks webinars what they are today, uh, and look forward to continuing to, to work with Julie in the future. Second, I'd like you to, uh, to welcome you to our new platform. So if you've been with us over the years, uh, you know that primarily we've been working on the Adobe Connect platform. We are now working off of the BlueJeans uh, webinar platform in order to try to improve upon our um, user experience and so just really quickly I was going to walk you through a couple of the, the functions on this webinar so to get you oriented so if you want to do a chat uh, you'll see on the right side of your screen a, a bar um, with um, icons the little sort of speaker bubble if you click on that you'll be able to do general chat to the audience um, below that you'll see uh, a bubble for I think the polls which kind of gives you like a little bar graph and then you'll see the um, button for the Q&A so when we do the question and answer please use the Q&A button to submit your questions that's where we'll look for them uh, during the Q&A sessions uh, and to ask uh, the presenters and speakers um, you'll also note that you should have the ability to resize uh, the screen um, down below underneath uh, the uh, presentation so you can move it such that uh, the um, speaker disappears and then you just only see the the presentation or you can sort of find a somewhere in the middle that uh, suits you best um, also um, please note that you can then see the the attendees um, you know, by clicking on the, the button up at the top. With that, if you have questions, please type the, your not your con issues with the platform. Um, please tap that into the general chat, and those uh, managing the webinar will be able to, to help you out. Um, in case you find, uh, so lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we'll email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once we have them ready. We will also post these resources on agrolinks.org. So thank you for your attention. Now onwards to our presentations and discussions for today's webinar, 10 Years of AgriLinks, a Community Retrospective. With that, I am pleased to welcome Mike Michener, Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Mike oversees the strategic direction and implementation of USAID's work on agriculture-led growth and the Bureau's efforts to engage and build partnerships with the private sector and research community in support of the U.S. government's Feed the Future initiative. Um, a little bit about Mike. Prior to working at USAID, uh, he served as Vice President of Product Policy and Innovation with the United States Council for International Business in Washington, D.C., and prior to that, as Director of Multilateral Relations for Crop Life International in Brussels, Belgium. He represented 
these trade associations before a range of international organizations, including United Nations, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, and the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. Uh, and then Mike has an extended uh, career with uh, the U.S. government. He has also served with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, first as Administrator for the Foreign Agriculture Service, and then as Minister Counselor at the U.S. Mission to the U.N. Agencies in Rome. He also worked with the State Department in several roles and the Department of Homeland Security. Mr. Michener began his career with the United States Army. And with that, I'm pleased to welcome Mike to the AgriLinks community. And I hand it over to you, Mike, to provide opening comments. Thanks, Zachary. Thanks for that uh, very warm welcome. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Yep, can hear you. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the AgriLinks community. Let me start out by saying a heartfelt happy 10th birthday to AgriLinks. Uh, this is a great accomplishment, and I look forward to another 10 years of knowledge sharing and learning happening on this site. I know that today's webinar continues a long history of events that began with the USAID Ag Sector Council Seminar Series in 2009. These events started as in-person events of 30 people inside USAID, and then started to evolve to bring in more of the agricultural and food security community. USAID launched AgriLinks to give practitioners outside of the agency the opportunity to join the conversation and to capture those presentations, so those who missed them could view them too. Now AgriLinks webinars often have 10 times as many people joining from across the globe. USAID has continued to add functionality to AgriLinks. Together with the events, these create theme months in order to improve the learning experience. I welcome the opportunity to participate uh, uh, in this conversation with you, the AgriLinks community. Admittedly, as a new appointee um, uh, here at USAID, I only recently discovered the great resources on AgriLinks. Uh, after a great meeting with one of our panelists, Vern Long of World Coffee Research, I visited my local coffee shop during Women's History Month, and I saw a display dedicated to uh, women-owned smallholder coffee farmers in Rwanda. I thought that might make a good topic for the March Feed the Future newsletter. Like many, I turned to the online oracle, Google, to find more information. The first search result that came up was an article on AgriLinks, and I had no idea that this was a USAID product. So I have followed AgriLinks ever since. In preparation for my remarks today, I've learned a number of facts about AgriLinks, such as the original mailing list started at around 400 people and has grown to over 25,000. Since its launch, AgriLinks has had over 3,800 blog posts, with much of that growth happening in the past few years. I think it speaks highly of the evolution and growth of the site. AgriLinks represents a great platform for knowledge sharing and demonstrates USAID's commitment to learning. It serves as a place to share technical information, the how-to around the Feed the Future initiative and our work with a variety of stakeholders that include implementing partners, academia, private sector, other donors, and other U.S. government agencies. I'm pleased to note the extent to which AgriLinks has served as a place where our U.S. government partner agencies have shared their technical knowledge and information around Feed the Future related activities. As an example, I highlight the collaboration between USAID and USDA on the Food Safety Network. Those leading the Food Safety Network have shared resources and information with the AgriLinks community to support learning across the globe. We look forward to continuing this partnership with AgriLinks to allow these types of knowledge exchanges in the implementation of Feed the Future activities. We need collaborations like these to strengthen our learning and increase our impact. Given our current challenges, our need for knowledge sharing and platforms like AgriLinks has never been greater. In agriculture and food security, we continue to have a host of areas where we want to focus our work. Two priority areas where AgriLinks has demonstrated its usefulness are with impacts of COVID-19 and climate change. In response to the challenges faced by the COVID pandemic, we have included the COVID-19 Learning Hub on AgriLinks where we can capture your community-generated learnings on COVID-19 and its impacts to share with a broader audience. This allows you to research the lessons learned from others or share your lessons so that we can all benefit. As many of you know, the Biden administration sees climate change as a top priority. 
As Zachary noted, one of AgriLink's first big multi-part series covered the integration of climate change and natural resources management into agriculture and food security programming. Through the years, AgriLynx has continued to share resources around climate change and climate smart agriculture with the community and collect information from the community to share with others. You can find on the site resources and materials from the USAID Global Learning and Evidence Exchanges, or GLEES, on climate smart agriculture held in Zambia and Cambodia. You can expect that we will continue to expand the number of resources AgriLynx provides that apply a climate change lens to agriculture and food security work. We will also strengthen our connections with the other Lynx Plus family of USAID technical sites, which includes now Climate Lynx. Thank you for your participation in the AgriLynx community and for welcoming me into your community. I look forward to continuing the conversation and strengthening knowledge sharing and learning throughout the agriculture and food security community to improve the outcomes of our work. And with that, I will hand it back over to Zachary to introduce today's panelists. Thank you very much, Mike. We really appreciate your participation today, and um, thank you for those those comments. Um, and so with that, uh, again, welcome to the AgriLynx community, and we look forward to your continued engagement with the community. Now let me introduce our distinguished panelists. Each of our panelists will give a brief presentation. We will then have a moderated question and answer session before opening it up for questions from you, our audience. So with that, First, I'd like to welcome uh, my wish, Professor Mywish Moreda, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Agriculture, Food, and Resource Economics at Michigan State University, with robust experience in conducting research and capacity building activities in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Her work focuses on the nexus of agricultural economics, food security policy, international development, and impact evaluation. She has led several research initiatives involving field experiments and extensive data collection on a wide range of topics. Uh, Professor Moreda has also served as the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Food Security Policy, associate director of the USAID-funded Bean, Cowpea, and Dry Grain Pulses Collaborative Research Support Program, also uh, known as a CRISP, and as a member of the standing panel on impact assessment of the CGIR's Science Council. With that, I hand it over to Professor Marina. Zachary, for that warm uh, welcome and, and introduction. First, let me start by wishing our grillings a very happy 10th anniversary. Um, and in this lightning talk, I will share my researcher's perspective on the state of agriculture and food security by looking back 10 years and then sharing some thoughts on moving forward. So let me, um, next slide, please. So let me begin by sharing my biased view that research is vitally important for meaningful development. The following may not be exhaustive, but here are some of the roles researchers play in development. Researchers are stakeholders and partners in these efforts. As partners, they add rigor, analytics, and evidence to guide scarce resources and help make investment decisions. Their tools, methods, and systematic approaches bring objectivity and credibility to this decision-making processes. And their analysis help meet accountability demands from stakeholders. The data, results, and findings generated by research foster learning. And most importantly, they expand the knowledge frontiers and, uh, and, and spur innovations to solve not only today's problems, but also tomorrow's challenges. Next slide. So given that we are celebrating a grilling's 10th anniversary, I think it is appropriate to take a stock of what have been some of the major development issues that researchers have been most focused in this past 10 years. Next. So just to give you a big picture view of research foci in development over the past 10 years, 
I made an inventory of all the publications in the last 10 years in two top interdisciplinary development journals, the World Development and the Global Food Security. I'm not claiming that this is a representative sample of all the research in development field, but I do believe that these two journals are sort of a, a good sounding boards of major topics and challenges that are at the forefront of the development community. So based on this inventory of more than 2,700 articles published since 2010 in the world development and more than 400 articles published in global food security since its inception in 2012, here are the top 25 words from the list of keywords or the titles of the articles. The size of each word in this cloud is proportional to its frequency, which can be used as an indicator of its importance in terms of research foresight this past 10 years. So some of the major themes that are eye-catching are nutrition, not surprisingly, climate change, policy, crop, yield, production, rural, land, sustainability, and price under the Global Food Security Journal, and aid, impact, evidence analysis, gender, livelihood, and Africa under the world development. Other topics of research this past 10 years that also appear, but relate in relatively smaller forms, um, you know, but they are still among the top 25 words, uh, among all the 35,000 words that I compiled from in this inventory include production, global supply, markets, famine, crisis, poverty, food insecurity, resource, fish, rice, governance, and politics. Since research is both demand and supply driven, this list is also an indicator of important challenges confronted by the development community or reflect their priorities in the past 10 years. Next slide. So what is the state of agriculture and food security today and what progress have we made or not this past 10 years? And here again is a big picture view on some of the indicators and metrics related to food production at the global level and for two developing regions that have been a major foresight of development effort, Africa and Asia. So globally, the trend in per capita total food production and of cereal production, which is a major source of calorie consumption, has continued to increase. However, for Africa, the rate of increase in food production has dropped since 2015. And the trend in cereal production is almost flat and seems to be more volatile, at least compared to Asia. Next. And here's an example. And here's an example. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this, the previous one, sorry. Here is an example of production indices. The previous one slide, please. Here is an example of production indices of two micronutrient-rich foods, the vegetable and fruit and milk. Uh, the next slide. Sorry for confusing, confusing your heads. <laughs> I meant the slide on vegetable and fruit and milk, the previous one. Uh, for both of these commodities, the trend is overall increasing in Asia and globally. But again, in Africa, the per capita vegetables and fruit production has flattened in the later half of the last decade after an increase uh, for a you know, first five, five years of that decade. On the other hand, the per capita milk production has been steadily declining over the last 10 years in Africa with no sign of flattening or reversing the trend. Next slide. And in terms of the big picture on food security and nutrition outcomes, um, again, the picture is not that flattering for Sub-Saharan Africa and even for South Asia. Instead of declining, 
these indicators the of food insecurity, undernourishment, and overnourishment have slightly increased this past years, 10 years. Of course, this big picture is masking the progress and positive changes that have happened or are happening in many pockets of the world, including parts of Africa and Asia. And perhaps many of you in the audience will have firsthand knowledge of these positive changes that are happening. But despite some healthy and thriving trees, this view of the forest seems static or even becoming less green. The problems of food insecurity and the double burden of malnutrition still remain critical challenges for development community. Next slide. So looking ahead, how should we move forward to address these chronic challenges? What should be the foci of development research? Again, combining the top 25 words across the two journals that I mentioned earlier, these are some of the themes, challenges that were the foci in the past 10 years. And many of this still remain important foci over the coming 10 years, like nutrition, climate change, sustainability, gender, and policy. Some may grow in importance, like market-led growth, diversifying livelihoods, urban development, and governance to promote institutions, incentives, investments, and innovation for transformative development. But to address systemic and emerging challenges, researchers will need to expand their foresight to include these other themes, topics. For example, nutrition will need to include a focus also on overnutrition and consumers, not only producers. Climate change issues will need to expand to include the challenges of shocks, conflict, resilience, innovations, and social protection. The theme of sustainability will need to expand to include not only land resources, but also water. Under gender, issues of equity, inclusivity, empowerment, and youth will get more to the far forefront. And we will need to move away from talking about agricultural systems to food systems, from a farm-focused development to midstream development and employment. Next. So a final point I would like to make in the spirit of learning from the past to move forward is that tackling these development challenges is like a marathon and not a sprint. The scale of the problems are huge and some are systemic and chronic in nature. So, In my opinion, as a development researcher, addressing these challenges will require concerted efforts and sustainable investments. It will require partnerships across sectors, stakeholders, and research disciplines. It will require creativity, innovation, and thinking outside the box. It will also require learning and adapting and capacity building to generate multiplier effects. And finally, it will require the power to influence policies and decisions that matter. Since we are celebrating 10 years of AgriLinks, I would like to add that AgriLinks is a perfect example of a platform that promotes several of these requirements. For instance, it promotes partnerships, learning and information sharing, training and capacity building, and helps communicate research-based evidence and development practitioners' ideas and experiences to decision makers. And so in doing so, it is helping us all better prepare for and run for this marathon. Thank you very much. And I, with that, I'll hand it over again to Zachary. Thank you very much, my wish for your, your presentation. We really appreciate it. And with that, I will segue into our next presenter. Uh, so I would like to welcome Vern Long. Vern Long serves as Chief Executive Officer of World Coffee Research, the world's first global collaborative agricultural research and design organization for coffee. A plant breeder by training, uh, Vern brings 25 years of experience in international agricultural 
research with a focus on smallholders and deep expertise on genetic resources policy. Prior to joining World Coffee Research, Long served as the director of the Office of Agriculture Research and Policy in USAID's former Bureau for Food Security. Long has substantial experience convening diverse stakeholders from industry, national governments, CDAR, international agricultural research centers, university scientists, and farmers to formulate a shared crop research agenda to improve productivity amongst smallholder farmers. Her work has spanned low and middle income countries in diverse geographies, including Central America, West Africa, East and Southern Africa, and South Asia. Um, I had the pleasure of beginning to work with Fern, I think, when she started uh, with USAID working on the first Feed the Future um, research strategy. Um, many, no, I think actually that was one of the first uh, presentations you might have been a part of uh, with AgriLinks uh, early on um, when we started. So with that, it's my great pleasure and honor to um, welcome Vern um, and have her start her presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Zachary, and thank you all for the warm welcome. Um, I want to check if you all can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. All Sounds right, good. great. Wonderful. So um, it's actually really fun to come to a birthday party when you see so many of your former colleagues and friends who are um, who are here today. So I think it's very fitting that we should all join together today um, for this 10 year anniversary of AgriLinks and the tremendous value that it's brought to our global community. Um, it's really remarkable that uh, the community grew from just 30 people who came together to get this started and growing to over 25,000. So I think 25,000 people at a birthday party is a pretty good number. So today what I'd like to do is to build on the, the um, presentation that MyWish has offered and really start to, to take it uh, to, in, a, in a direction that is inclusive of the considerations from the private sector as many private um, companies and the private sector generally is very interested and, um, and can really committed to strengthening um, their contributions to the SDGs. Uh, next slide. So when we think about what AgriLinks has brought to us over the last 10 years, which is a tremendous value for the broader uh, global community committed to these goals of reducing poverty and eliminating hunger, um, communications platforms are so critical to guide the development of a shared agenda. I think that, um, if we can go to the next slide, I think that one of the, the key elements is the, the opportunity to not only share information and create a, a connectivity, but also to facilitate and curate that information. And I think that that's one of the critical features of the knowledge management team in the Bureau, as well as um, the AgriLinks team, is that curation of information and to stage information and to bring it out and to enable um, the exposure of information to the community, but then also allowing the community to dive much more deeply into the evidence, into the information, to really um, forge our way together for uh, a, a shared commitment towards reducing poverty and addressing global hunger. When I look back over the last 10 years, um, it was in 10 years ago, in fact, that I joined the Bureau to um, contribute to the development of the research strategy and a few iterations of that, in fact. And the agricultural exchange, the ag exchange that was hosted on AgriLinks was a really momentous shift in how that research strategy was developed. The opportunity to use AgriLinks as a platform to enable us to engage researchers and thought leaders and uh, community members from across the world was absolutely tremendously powerful. And when we launched that, um, that Ag Exchange to invite in information, I'll be really honest, there were areas where we had complete blind spots. Um, we uh, structured this opportunity in a way to um, be as inclusive as possible. So we had a moderator in New Zealand, there was a moderator in Ethiopia and a moderator in North America, which allowed for every single time zone to have a real time work day conversation. And I appreciate those of you who are calling in from, from Asia and around the world at, at very um, challenging uh, times because I realize this is late night for some of you and it's really wonderful that we can create this opportunity to bring us all together for this wonderful birthday party. But what is so powerful about the the AgriLinks platform and how it was used um, 
for consulting and, and distilling information from across the community was the idea that we could actually have curated conversations that really dove deep, identified new areas that allowed uh, the team at USAID and the, the interagency to, um, to explore those, those blind spots that we had and then come forward with uh, the procurements and the programs that really sought to deliver on the research agenda, uh, the shared research agenda of the broad, broader community to achieve the goals set out in the Global Food Security Program. So I think that one of the, the things that is really important as we look forward as well is to maintain that rich, inclusive, comprehensive engagement with the broader community and the curation function, making sure that they're experts, as, as um, Dr. Meridia noted, the bringing in uh, researchers who have done deep work in some of these domains and sharing that information to give us more understanding of the issues facing um, the, the global food security challenges of the, of the years ahead. Uh, next slide. So when we look forward about, um, you know, what's going to be happening over the next 10 years, the, the points that Dr. Meridia made about the, the um, emerging terms like governance and climate change, these are absolutely on the front burner for the private sector. And um, while I'm in the world of, of coffee now, um, the challenges are, are um, very clear across many of my member companies around these questions of environmental, social, and governance reporting. There's a deep commitment on the part of companies to figure that out. And I and I just like to offer this for those of you who are um, in the Bureau or who have historically worked on the Feed the Future indicators. These are an actually really important tool that many across the industry have used as a way to develop metrics and indicators for themselves, for their own programs and investments that advance the shared goals of global food security. And so I just wanted to, to flag that the platforms like AgriLinks are critical for bringing that consolidation of knowledge to um, companies who are struggling to identify how they can most effectively address this. Um, they aren't in the business of doing what uh, Feed the Future and the broader community, the global food security community is doing, um, but they want to integrate that work into their, into their efforts. And so um, as we increasingly see more and more attention to ESG reporting in companies, um, these, the need for curation and conversation and understanding of what's possible, both in terms of programmatically what kinds of programs work and that um, sharing of evidence around what kinds of programs work and, and what kinds of modica modifications can be made to um, achieve the, the um, poverty reduction and hunger alleviation goals of many programs um, and greater equity across um, uh, the benefits accrued to, to communities. We really have an opportunity to um, and are very excited to engage on platforms like AgriLinks to learn what's been learned, best practices, and to move it forward. Increasingly, with the um, with the challenges of the global supply chains as a commodity that's predominantly produced in the tropical in tropical countries, in low and middle income countries, uh, global supply chains um, have really been um, challenged, especially in the last year with uh, with COVID, obviously. But there's been a very frank and open conversation about the need to distribute as opposed to concentrate production. And so um, this actually creates tremendous opportunity for low and middle and low and lower middle income countries that are interested in producing tropical commodities that have um, global demand. And this is um, particularly compelling for coffee because uh, as an industry, we benefit tremendously from successful, profitable production of coffee in many countries. And so that opportunity to distribute the benefit of this global commodity, um, which also reduces risk for the private sector, but as well creates opportunity for small and medium sized enterprises in low and lower middle income countries that are seeking to drive their economy forward. Um, as my wish noted, we're moving from this um, you know, farm focused economic development agenda to a broader um, across the economy look at what are the kinds of sectors in an economy that can drive opportunity. And when we think about global supply chains in a commodity like coffee, we see tremendous opportunity for small and medium sized enterprises in producing countries, um, logistics operators, people who own a truck, a small trucking company can become a medium sized trucking company moving coffee from um, production areas to ports. And so there's a tremendous number of opportunities in warehouses and logistics that are really um, uh, key to driving economic opportunity and distributing that benefit across the economy and the revenue that's generated from this. Um, and so I think that as we look forward, um, and we are all feeling our way forward on how to most effectively align investment 
to ensure that we are catalyzing these um, virtuous systems of, of economic opportunity, that platforms like AgriLinks are critical for sharing best practices, lessons learned, and um, creating an open and transparent platform for communication between um, government and the private sector uh, and, and the broader implementing community, the nonprofit communities that are um, really critical to, to creating linkages and bridges to get this work done. I think one of the other challenges, um, which was noted in the word clouds that uh, Dr. Meridia offered, is the climate crisis. More and more companies are thinking about how genuinely can they take stock of the way that agriculture works, For in our case in coffee, but this is not just specific to coffee, um, how can we really reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and contribute to the mitigation agenda? Um, and, and really looking very rigorously at scope one, two, and three emissions and thinking about how we can contribute to that. I think there is some very natural um, connectivity between these um, company level goals around reducing emissions that can be aggregated and built up to create partnerships and collaborations to really both think this through, what are the methods and approaches that make the most sense, and the convening role of an entity um, like the Bureau or you know, the US government broadly, certainly. Um, but AgriLinks has a platform, and the, I know that there's a Climate Links um, platform as well, but um, it, you know, agriculture is such an incredible um, driver of economic opportunity in low and lower middle income countries. We really need to um, ensure that that conversation about how this work can happen is happening um, in places where the agricultural community and, and the broader development community on food security is, is linked in. And I think it's um, just a tremendous amount of willingness and interest in collaboration and partnership um, and thinking about it at, a, at an industry-wide level and not just necessarily company by company. Um, next slide. So looking forward, uh, I think that one of the, the key elements that we seek to, as an industry and um, more broadly across the private sector, is to develop systems of mutual accountability because um, there's a real need for greater connectivity and linkages between the private sector, um, particularly um, the international private sector, the global um, business community, and national governments who are seeking to advance sustainability goals, and whether that's um, just the SDG portfolio as a whole. And I think that um, platforms like AgriLinks are really critical for sharing the metrics for um, measuring impact and um, providing that deep dive into indicator development. It can sometimes seem like a thankless task when you're inside um, a government agency tasked with these very challenging issues, but the community is really depending and counting on um, that leadership and that intellectual engagement of the broad community of m and specialists who can really bring those, um, you know, consolidate that knowledge and information and bring it to consensus on how those metrics should look and what those indicators are, because so many organizations use those indicators. Um, you'd be surprised. So um, I think the other piece, of course, is sharing evidence and best practices. A tremendous amount has been learned over the last 10 years. And as we think about the um, expansion of, co of complexity, there's so much more complexity facing um, the low and lower middle income countries as they come out of the COVID period and the, and the competing choices around investment and what can, what kinds of investments can catalyze opportunity. And from the coffee industry's perspective, we're thinking about how we can support local communities in um, recovery, but as well um, driving forward on economic opportunity and greater distributive opportunity um, to men and women farmers um, in, in coffee around the world. And so sharing evidence and best practices on platforms like AgriLinks is a really important place for us to, to come together and, um, and learn and do better with each cycle of, of programming going forward. I think the, the element of facilitating conversations um, is going to an even deeper level. Um, instead of just company um, specific engagement, I think industry wide engagement is really critical. And um, platforms like AgriLinks are well positioned to provide that, um, bringing together entire industries. Tropical commodities generally have a lot of equities and interest in um, strengthening the long term sustainability of the economies um, in, in producing countries, whether it's cocoa or tea or coffee. And so I think that having this industry-wide engagement to really think through how industry can orient its investment and its resources to most effectively achieve uh, the goals that we all share around sustainable development, um, is it, this platform is really critical for, for um, deepening that conversation and um, moving forward as we 
have a lot of questions about the climate crisis that we don't know the answers to and that it requires bringing in so many more expertise that we don't otherwise have access to and bringing it into um, uh, into a local conversation with a um, a community of 25,000 minds, uh, there's nothing that can't be achieved. And so I think that uh, this is something that we we certainly in coffee would be very, very excited to engage with you all um, as you as you build your programming in the in the months and years ahead um, to, to really support you as you as you bring together that diverse uh, community of voices to help us shape the path. Uh, next slide. And so with that, I would just like to say thank you so much for all the tremendous work that you've done. Um, AgriLinks has been an incredible resource and tool, and I look forward to um, its continued strengthening and its transition to this new platform. It's doing really beautifully, and um, I look forward to the questions uh, as we proceed. So back to you, Zachary. Thank you very much, Vern. I really appreciate uh, your comments. And uh, now I'll go to the next presenter. So. Rob Bertram serves as the chief scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where he serves as a key advisor on a range of technical and program issues to advance global food security and nutrition. In this role, he leads USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research, technology, and implementation in support of the US government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, Feed the Future. He previously served as Director of the Office of Agriculture Research and Policy in the former Bureau for Food Security. Prior to that, he guided USAID investments in agriculture and natural resources uh, research for many years. Um, Rob's academic background in plant breeding and genetics includes degrees from University of California, Davis, the University of Minnesota, and the University of Maryland. He also studied international affairs at Georgetown University and was a visiting scientist at Washington University in St. Louis. Before coming to USAID, he served at, with USDA's international programs as well as overseas with the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, otherwise known as the CGIR. Um, with that, a warm welcome to Rob. Thank you for joining us, Rob. Zachary, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be in such good company. Uh, uh, at the same time and really happy to be part of the celebration. Um, Zachary asked me to think about the journey we've all been on over the arc of the Feed the Future, which is also the arc of AgriLinks. Um, and so um, I'm going to try to trace the story from what began as a supplemental under President Bush, became a, pres a presidential initiative under President Obama, and then was codified into law in 2016 in the Global Food Security Act, reauthorized in 2018 by President Trump for five years, evidence of the strong bipartisan support for this work, and backed consistently by a billion dollars in uh, annual funding from the Congress, uh, even when OMB sought to uh, greatly reduce the size and scope of, of uh, Feed the Future. So to do what Zachary asked me, I had it was sort of fun. And I w went back and, and looked at some old slides from almost 10 years ago. And um, I'm going to take you through some of those and then uh, jump forward to some more recent slides and then try to, to pull some threads together about what has animated our thinking over time. Uh, my wish and, and Vern have set the stage beautifully and covered many of the things that I'll allude to. Uh, but the idea here is really to also trace the course of AgriLinks, because this was the venue where we came together, we put ideas out, people asked questions, sometimes tough questions, sometimes we had a range of views, all of which uh, animated Feed the Future and built a global community to achieve its objectives of ending hunger, malnutrition and, and extreme poverty. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is completely familiar to you, and I, it works pretty well today, just as it did when 10 years ago. But the irony here is this slide could have been uh, in 2006 or 2007. Everything there on that slide we knew was the case at that time. Uh, uh, yet. We all know that something big happened in 2008, 
but I wanted you to know that the request for agricultural funding for 2008 was the, the lowest in nominative, nominal terms, in other words, inflated dollars in, uh, since the 1970s. So that's how far this issue had fallen off the global agenda. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, as we all know, there was a food price crisis uh, that was at the time seen as a, a food crisis for people who were experiencing it firsthand. A um, few points on this. It was unexpected. Uh, it was complex in its causes, but it led to civil unrest. It led to governments. I mean, the Arab Spring, many people suggest that the Arab Spring began with these food price spikes, uh, but it, it was global. And uh, we saw big policy failures. Remember, you might recall when Vietnam and other countries put halted exports of rice and what that did in countries like the Philippines and elsewhere, and also how price spikes in one crop triggered price spikes in others. It was a domino effect. But I guess the, the happy ending, if there is one, is, is that this did serve to, it was a wake up call to the world. And there really were some structural issues uh, under, underneath this. It wasn't just a blip. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this, um, this led us to the establishment of Feed the Future. Uh, there was an, a 2009 authorization for 800 million, which wasn't just emergency. It also included research and technology, and that was under President Bush. But in President, what you, some of you may recall, when in President Obama's first inaugural address, he talked about working with partner countries to help them make their farmers' fields flourish. It was a lovely alliteration. I'll never forget it. It was about 15 degrees. I was standing on the mall and just about fell over when I heard that, um, after having been sort of out in the cold uh, for a long time in terms of our, our collective sector and, and interest. So Feed the Future was born. Ann Tutwiler, some of you may know, gave it the name. Um, I always, though, say that feeding the future starts with feeding the present. In other words, if you're trying to get to a goal where everybody is well fed and nourished, you can't ignore those who aren't at right now. So even though we talk about what we need in 2050, Feed the Future's work is very much here and now. Um, so agriculture came back. Um, uh, the, the nutrition and poverty and hunger links were there. Uh, the staples led growth, that gets mentioned a lot. That was based on a lot of evidence that crops that were widely grown and widely consumed were the most effective to, to cause a surplus in the economy and create jobs and, and, and reduce poverty. Uh, but it was not exclusive, even at the beginning. We did work on animal source foods, legumes, and horticulture. Uh, and then the private sector, this is another thing that each successive administration likes to think of it as being focused on the private sector. I, I think we pretty much did accept that from the beginning. I think we, what, we's ha what has happened is we've tried to continue to refine how we uh, address, uh, engage that sector. Uh, the next slide, please. So this is an old slide. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, there's not too many surprises on here. I just want to flag uh, number three, which of uh, uh, other speakers have already referred to the important role of research and science and technology. And of course, Rod Shaw was our first administrator coming from the Gates Foundation, so no, and from chief scientist role at USDA. Uh, uh, so he was very, very committed to that. And then also number six, which was really new, which was the integration of nutrition and, and, and uh, the, the services piece of the nutrition specific with uh, and the attempt to bring that together with with work in agriculture and food. Uh, next slide, please. So this was um, the how really was quite different though. It wasn't just business as usual. First of all, the country led piece. The idea that if partner countries didn't prioritize something, we shouldn't either. So that was critical. And that also led to the zones of influence issue, which also was very much tied up in the accountability. I'll say more on that. Um, the focus on gender, very much, again, evidence-based, and both for economic objectives to reduce poverty, but also importantly for nutrition objectives, particularly outcomes for children. 
um, there was a, a shift away from perhaps sort of low input uh, uh, status uh, analytical uh, farming systems approaches to one that was really more about productivity growth to drive income growth and 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 poverty reduction. And of course, poverty productivity growth isn't just on the farm; it's all across the food system. I'll say more on that. Uh, capacity uh, was recognized. Always a struggle. Well, we've done that, uh, but you might recall that we were one of the first. USAID forward uh, efforts where we really prioritized working through local partners. M&E was built into the budget, both centrally and in our the much greater bilateral programs, larger programs in, in, in our Feed the Future focus countries. Again, that focus country idea is part of the country-led piece, and it's also part of the accountability piece because the zones of influence were where we 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 took our, our cue really from PEPFAR. Remember, this came just a couple years after PEPFAR. And the idea was that we would be accountable for changes at the population level, not just project outcome. So this meant a, a reduction, 20% reduction in extreme poverty and a 20% reduction in child stunting in our zones of, 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 of influence. That was a tremendous game changer in terms of how this was perceived on Capitol Hill, uh, and I think among the community, and certainly in AID, where it was focus, 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 because we had the, we were on the hook uh, for those. And the great news is, and I hope you all know this, is that we achieved that. The, the, the data that came out at the beginning of the last administration, really about the first six, seven years, gave the evidence in almost every situation we achieved those goals. And I think one, oh, the next slide, please. I think I put this up, this is a much more re recent one, and I, it's a newer slide, but I wanted to just say that it still works. The data still shows us that growth in agriculture is up to four times, uh, the agriculture sector is as much as four times as effective. And that in, can include in things like it's trucking and, and some of the agribusiness things that, that Vern mentioned. Uh, and yet, what did we see at the same time? Hunger and nutrition, malnutrition rising much of it, though, linked with uh, climate, with conflict, excuse me. Uh, sometimes comp, uh, conflict could be linked to climate change as well, but, but that was a, a big change. And then the next slide is there to remind us that we're part of a longer term story. Um, this didn't just start, of course, 10 years ago. And you can see there what's happened if you look at that, what happened since 1960. That's the Green Revolution. That's the, uh, 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 the, the, the population growth, which 50 years ago people thought parts of the world would starve. That hasn't happened, thank God. And it hasn't happened because of that top line. And the other piece, of course, is the, the, the sloping down uh, price line, which you can see the big spike that occurred uh, eight, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. But um, that has had the effect of making especially poor people richer every day because they spend less of their meager incomes on food and they have more for everything else, including things like school, health care, and investment. The last thing on this slide is notice the little line that oops, please go back. The last that that line at the bottom, that is going to become a much bigger topic of conversation. We don't trumpet this. This is the shift from extensification, which has been dominant in human history, to intensification. And especially if we were to look closely at this, which we don't have time to do, we will see that it's really now being driven by knowledge, information, better genetics, uh, resource use efficiency, rather than inputs. But that, is a, that piece is critical if we think about the global environment, biodiversity challenges, or climate change. And Ratan Lal, if you haven't seen his symposia from the World Food Prize, please do look at it. He really dives in and shows how ag food and agriculture, climate change, and, and the environment uh, and biodiversity are inextricably linked and interdependent. Uh, next slide, please. So we, as I've, I think you've gotten a sense, um, things were not static. I'm not going to say speak to COVID, or Mike, talked about that very compellingly at the beginning of the, the, the seminar. But 
Uh, policy was seen as a gap right away. Actually, it got retrofitted almost from the beginning. It wasn't there, though, at the beginning to the extent it needed to be. Although in the Bureau, we had the Agricultural Research and Policy Office, which did recognize, I think those of us within uh, recognize the importance of policy as, as enabling uh, 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 all kinds of other investments. And Oops, it seems Rob might have frozen. Oh, hopefully we haven't lost him. We'll give him a second. Um, if you have questions, please take a moment to enter. Oh, there you go. Back. Rob, can you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, you're you're back now. I'll hand well, it back I'm, to you. I'm so sorry. I'm so no sorry. Worries. <laughs> so I've got to, I've got to finish up here though. Um, so then we saw uh, the scaling, then resilient, and this was very different. It was It's very different kind of theory of change from what we had in 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 feed the future. Uh, and very much about saving future humanitarian expenditures and working in more challenging environments. Uh, and the evidence base is still being developed for that. Food systems, everybody's talking about it. I think the challenge there is uh, keeping the, the needs of the poor and hungry from being overwhelmed by the focus on climate and obesity. There are solutions that, that, where they all come together, but that's our big challenge. And to figure out a theory of change, we don't have one this point, but but our team and the Nutrition Center and uh, the, the new Innovation Lab are going to focus on just that. Agroecology, a nice idea, but it's really, and everybody should be for it, but it's a question of how science-based it is versus how faith-based it is. And then inclusion, I put that in to be a little provocative because, of course, the focus has been on poverty as being the means to inclusivity and in, engaging. There are sometimes questions with all of these about trade-offs. And that's why it's so important to have economists in the room to tell us, help us understand the vital importance of where to put those marginal dollars. All of these things that we would like to do, do entail uh, trade-offs. Next slide, please. I'm gonna just go quickly here that there are pressures on prices, but the other message here from climate change and the role of science in meeting it is the pressure on land and area and giving us ample room for diversification rather than extensification of staples. So this is just, a, again, this is part of that Ratan Lao discussion. Um, and uh, the next slide then, I just wanted, this was an old slide, but I felt it captured the smallholder focus, the concept of farmer choice, the role of policy, the importance of systems level approaches, which was missing early on, although we tried to put it in, but now it's it's been very much more adopted. The knowledge to inform uh, better decision making as being a critical piece of what we talk about when we say sustainable intensification. And then the idea that we reduce risk and catalyze investment at all levels by increasing productive potential. Doing those things at once is what's critical. Next slide. And then I just put this to show you that this can be shown in different ways, uh, th that we can communicate and project our work in new ways. The only thing I, my criticism of this slide, which I got from Jerry Glover, is that the land saving and the land issue isn't there yet. But it's, 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 it's very much, uh, it does capture how we can refresh how we bring our ecological, genetic, and social approaches to bear on the outcomes that you see in the center. And uh, next slide, please. And let's just tick through this. This is my wish list. You'll see some of this, but the last one is what I want to focus on. One more. I'm hoping that we'll see under the Biden-Harris administration and the U.S. global leadership a, a, a renewed commence, a consensus around SDG2 and ending hunger in a climate-challenged world with climate change being the existential issue that threatens all the gains we've made 
but very much achieving our goals as laid out in SDG 2, which relates, of course, to the climate change SDG, to the poverty SDG. And the last slide, please, is to just say happy birthday to AgriLinks. Um, you have been the place where all these issues have been shared and debated. The evidence has been reviewed. Uh, so proud to have Zachary and Julie as colleagues and to see what they've created over this time. And Zachary's leadership has just been extraordinary. Also to our colleagues in KDAD and now KDLT, just fantastic to work with. I've been lucky to be part of many of these and it's I can't tell you how much work and thought goes into producing them. And uh, also congratulations on Blue Jeans. I don't miss Adobe Connect. And uh, again, thanks to all of you for building and being part of this global community that is helping steer our ship, which started out as a rowboat, but is now a, a, a full-fledged uh, ocean liner. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much, Rob. We appreciate the the uh, warm thanks and your continued engagement with the AgriLinks community, um, which has been a big part of our growth. Um, and from the very get-go, uh, you've been a big champion of knowledge sharing and learning, participating in AgriLinks events, as well as in trainings that we had developed for USAID staff and others. So big thanks um, to you as well. So with that, I thank all of our presenters today um, for their comments and their um, presentations. And real, as part of this, I wanted to do just uh, pose some questions um, based on their presentations and sort of based on looking forward uh, and the participation with uh, AgriLinks. Um, so my first question is kind of building off of uh, Rob's uh, last couple of slides on the United Nations uh, General Assembly set the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, in 2015 with the intent of achieving them by 2030. Um, focusing on SDG 2, which is end hunger, achieve food security, and improved uh, nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture, also known as zero hunger, what challenges and opportunities do you see over the next 10 years for achieving, to try to achieve SDG 2? Which, you know, they're hoping, you know, we're meeting those targets and achieving that within, you know, the time frame from now until 2030. Uh, I'll put it to my wish first, and then we can kind of go amongst the panel members. Oh, okay. Thank you. I just had to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, I think in my uh, lightning talk, I tried to sort of cover some of this in terms of what um, the, the agenda should look like in the next 10 years. Um, so, so just to reiterate some of those points, you know, over the next 10 years, I think the challenges of shocks, conflict, environmental degradation and double burden of malnutrition will remain at the forefront. And so to address the SDG 2, we will need to continue our efforts that we have begun this past 10 years on, on nutrition, on you know, big themes like nutrition, climate change, sustainability, gender, and policy. Um, but we will also need to expand our foci and investments to bring in uh, the, the focus on diversifying livelihoods, risk mitigating innovations, urban development, um, you know, diet choices that consumers are making, um, the, the governance to promote, uh, you know, inclusive uh, and transformative growth. Um, and again, the, the theme of sustainability will um, need to also expand to include, you know, uh, other than land resources like water, you know, uh, uh, how, how can we make uh, that resource more accessible and available for food production? Um, and also the gender issues of equity, you know, will will need to in, expand and, and focus more on on the issues of equity and inclusivity and empowering people who are underprivileged um, uh, uh, historically. And and you know, those are some of the issues that will need to be uh, uh, brought uh, in the forefront in the next ten years. Burn. 
Certainly. And I, I think that um, one area where I feel like I mean, there's uh, there are many things to be done, but one area that I think that would benefit tremendously from um, to enable us to more effectively tackle these goals is inclusivity, um, consu like essentially engaging the broader community in the research agenda. There are research activities that are undertaken that deliver short, medium, and long-term benefits to producers and consumers. And I think that one of the things that we see, even just in, in coffee, my very specific example, but you know, broadly, coffee growers grow food security crops. They grow bananas, they grow beans, they grow a number of food security crops. And having a more dynamic conversation between farming communities to understand how these crops work together so that we can be more resource use efficient, that we're thinking about how water is used to my wishes point, coffee processing requires a lot of water. And so we really need to think very carefully about how we apportion those resources for the um, successful, the success of, of smallholder farmers and farmers in rural communities, recognizing that um, that research is often happening without as much consultation and engagement of local communities and even other other actors, other parts of the, the consuming community to understand what their priorities are. And I think that greater consultation and engagement, platforms like AgriLinks for some parts of that community, but also more local engagement, the tools and support for um, national government research bodies and university researchers in producing countries and in low and middle income countries, helping develop those tools for consultation to define the research agenda, to ensure that some of these issues are attended to. Because I think sometimes we think about it after the fact, and I think this is something we can do much more intentionally on the front end, thinking about resource use efficiency and getting community input into research prioritization would be um, one area specifically where we could do better um, as we go forward. Excellent. Thank you, Vern. Uh, Rob, I know you touched on um, climate change as one of those challenges. Uh, do you want to expand on that, or do you have other? I do actually. <laughs> you read my mind, Zachary. Uh, and that is that what we need is for the climate change consensus to keep the needs of the extreme poor and undernourished, malnourished, chronic, chronic undernutrition, keep those in view. Uh, uh, things like child stunting and, and to those human outcomes, to keep them in view and to recognize that not one size fits all. And so while we're, we're focused on certain kinds of changes in, in, uh, in, in some of the developed countries that we hear a lot about, in the developing world, I think we do need to try to achieve a consensus that intensification rather than extensification is the, is the answer. Whether we want to reduce poverty or whether we want to uh, uh, stop deforestation or, or, or otherwise uh, preserve wetlands, hillsides, and other uh, fragile areas. I'm, I, I, this is not an easy thing. There is a whole movement right now to try to stop the use of fertilizers in Africa. I mean, this is, you know, this is, Africa will not have the biomass to have the soil organic matter it needs if we only rely on, on practices and rather not to augment those with things like phosphorus, nitrogen, and other minerals. So, you know, some of these things, uh, I hope that we'll find a way to keep the, the climate consensus. It's great that it's back. Uh, it's, it's driven, the biggest wind in the sail is mitigation, more than adaptation. But I think the adaptation wind, if we can try to keep the fact that we're bending the curve, we're not necessarily reducing emissions, but we're helping reduce emissions intensity. That kind of understanding that will allow smallholder farmers to move from drudgery to mechanization, to increase their profitability, to feed their families and their communities better. So that kind of how those things sort out. And this next year or two is really critical about for this because these dialogues are happening now. And we are very fortunate to have Ann Vaughn in the Bureau. You've just spent Mike this morning. Ann Vaughn is leading our work in this space. And, and uh, I, I really hope that all of the community can be part of that dialogue to make sure we get this outcome that recognizes the differing needs of differing areas, but how they all add up to a global a solution to a global challenge. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. Um, key points to, to keep in mind. 
Um, sort of building or, you know, going with that, the idea of the things we need to keep in mind, the, the challenges, uh, I was wondering what new or evolving technology, I know we're talking about engagement with stakeholders and sort of the work on the front end, but what new or evolving technologies do you think as uh, the potential to make significant change in the next 10 years? So to help achieve the, the goals that we've set out. We can go from you, Rob, and go back to. Because I know you probably have a lot of good questions. Well, I think some of it is very basic. Uh, oh, I've muted, I think. Can you hear you? me? Yep, oh, okay. It says, it says, okay. Um, it's asking me if I'm trying to speak. Anyway, uh, what I was going to say is uh, basic agronomy is still a huge need in, in the poorest areas, and we see that. It's great to talk about a lot of other things, including genetics. I'm all for it. But basic agronomy is, and this is why so much of our work that Jerry Glover and others uh, work lead is, is engaging that. The second thing I think is the information piece that we're greatly assisted by digital approaches that allows and informs better decision making. I think those two things coming together with availability and access to technologies and options and information, that will be the trick to at least dealing with the, 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 the very poor areas that are still struggling to in any way provide livelihoods or be competitive. Vern, your thoughts? Sure. Um, I think we've been talking a lot about um, digital uh, tools in the coffee industry of late, um, everything from blockchain to data systems where you can, you know, scan the QR code on your coffee bag and meet the farmer who grew your coffee. I mean, there's tremendous strides that are being made in, um, in our industry, certainly with use of digital tools. But one of the things that we've seen as well is the need for curation of data and um, better algorithms to help inform uh, the, what do those data mean? So what does it mean that I've had this much rainfall? So what do I do? Do I apply fertilizer? Do I not apply a fertilizer? That curation is key. And so I think that one of these um, points, just in terms of farmer facing technologies that farmers need, and to Rob's point about the need for strengthening information for farmers to intensify production, to do plain old agronomy that's been well known for decades, some of these very um, unsexy, un, you know, it's not new technology, it's, it's what's really worked, but it's helping farmers understand what the opportunities are and helping them see where there's, um, where they're making decision tools that help them assess those trade-offs. Sometimes the labor required simply isn't worth it. Well, that's telling you something about the market signal. So farmers generally know um, what their market signals are and what their time constraints are. And I think decision tools that can help them pull more information into better decision making is key. And curation services is really is one of them. So um, platforms to amplify information out to farmers are really important. We see coffee farmers all over the world with their smartphones accessing data, but then having that one little extra extra piece, which is the curation of information to help them better um, better make decisions. And some of that can be automated. We've definitely seen AI tools coming in um, that have helped automate some of that decision making. But I think that there's there's still a need to get to get a little further. I think in the next five years we're going to see great strides in that space. Excellent. Thank you. And yes, curation is key on just about every platform uh, to make it easier for the user. Uh, my wish. So I have two parts to that uh, uh, question, uh, uh, two answers to that question. One, my answer would have been same if you would have asked me in 2011, just at the inception of our feelings. Uh, you know, what are what do we need to do in the next 10 years to make a significant change? And uh, it builds on what Rob and Warren has said that I think we have uh, on the shelf technologies already available um that and practices that we know work uh that just need to be brought to farmers fields um and and we need to increase their adoption um so it's it's not new technology but it's it's the same technology but we need to find new ways to make them uh, uh you know uh, adopted by farmers so um so so that's the one part of that that the answer to that question which would have been same 
uh, 10 years ago, if you would have asked me. Uh, the other part is building again on what Vern and uh, Rob said is, you know, taking advantage of this digital revolution and the uh, uh, and, and the, you know, the, the expansion uh, or the use and penetration of mobile phones um, in, uh, uh, in, in rural areas and even remote areas is, uh, you know, how do we uh, you take advantage of that uh, and bring more information, the power of information in the hands of farmers as they make decisions uh, on, on some of this uh, input use. Uh, uh, as they are, you know, making, you know, day-to-day -day decisions. So, so I think, yeah, just reinforcing those two uh, uh, points that were already uh, made by Rob and Warren. Thank you, um, my wish. Uh, again, thanks the, to the speakers. I'll go to questions from our audience. Um, I would like to, to note if you go to the Q&A and you can click on um, one answer or answers to the questions, uh, my wish has answered a, a couple of those questions um, from one from Julie McCarty and one from Carl Gannett. Uh, I will ask a question from Dan Norell, uh, I think would be probably directed towards Rob, but uh, feel, uh, my wish and Vern, please feel free to jump in as well. Uh, the question goes, with the large increase in those living in extreme poverty, over 1 million more or 16% increase by the end of 2021, uh, with over 750 million living in extreme poverty, how will Feed the Future and AgriLinks focus on lifting these households uh, from extreme poverty? Thanks, Zachary, and, and thanks for the question. Uh, you know, we've had some very serious shocks of late. Uh, COVID is part of that. We've seen the co contraction in demand. We've seen the vulnerability of, of some of the most profitable and important for nutrition uh, 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 value chains where there's a lot of human contact, animal source foods, horticulture. So the shocks are real and the, 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 the speaker is, is right to call that out. I think Policy, of course, is a critical piece. Uh, I think this also calls into question finance and investment, and that would be uh, another piece that uh, I would have added maybe if I, we had a second round on the first question, and that is, you know, how do we capitalize these undercapitalized systems? I think I'm hoping, Zachary, that our colleagues, our brilliant colleagues in the financial world, and we've beefed up our staff in that area, are gonna help us figure out how to get more capital. But that'll be important also to respond uh, to the point that the questioner's making, in the, at least in the longer term. In the short term, of course, safety nets remain important, but they're cold comfort in many areas. I mean, there's just huge swaths of the world where I think the people with it, the uh, speaker, uh, the questioner is asking about, those are really not, not on offer. So I think, unfortunately, some of our, longer term efforts to uh, redouble uh, uh, the efforts and uh, uh, to, to, to build back uh, 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 better, as uh, President Biden says, we'll have to guide our work for now. Beyond that, I just hope we're gonna get, get that consensus I mentioned to really to, to up our game because as, as the questioner implies, the challenge has, has, has expanded. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thoughts from Vern or Mywish? No? Uh, nothing from me to add. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, from the next question from uh, Graham, I think, Thiel, uh, could you elaborate on the theory of change for food systems? I think this would be perhaps directed to Mywish you had mentioned in your uh, presentation about thinking about food systems. Uh, thank you, Graham, for that question. I think it will require, <laughs> uh, the answer is an essay rather than a short, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, paragraph on, on, on how to, you know, the whole theory of change of food system. I can maybe go one on one, one on one with Graham later on, maybe by email and respond to that question. But uh, I don't think I, I, I have my thoughts organized enough to give the theory of change right away on the food system.
unless my colleagues Rob or Juan have any thoughts yeah. or, or things they, it, they want to add. Mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah, happy to do that. Uh, thanks. Well, I, I bet somebody. I, I think I said in my talk. I don't think we have a robust theory of change yet, because of the complexity, the inherent complexity of food systems. And I think people, even people who are leading these efforts, will admit this. Those diagrams you see, the high-level panel, there's one produced in our bureau. They're representations. They're not pathways to drive changes, particularly changes that are necessarily going to reduce hunger and poverty, or the, most, the people who are really losing out on the food system. So this is a work in progress. And as I said, we have a new innovation lab coming where, where this is the focus. So I guess one answer then is, is really to stay tuned. But I think it's incumbent upon all of us to really continue to hold this, this school of thought to the challenge of, of not losing sight. Uh, uh, and, and there's a huge push for good reasons on obesity and climate change. But the needs of the undernourished, the extreme poor who are concentrated in these rural areas in developing countries, they need to be part of that uh, calculus as well. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so for the next question it comes from uh, Dick Tinsley. How much of the agriculture production research is looking at the physical potential without addressing the operational limitations in terms of labor? Uh, uh, in terms of labor, the dietary energy to fuel that labor and access to contract mechanization to facilitate crop establishment. Uh, Rob? Well, great. Thank Dick, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I had a talk with, uh, some of you may know Fred Cazito in West Africa with the CGIR system. He said to me just recently that service provision is coming to Africa. This is what we've all been waiting for. It was transformative uh, in South Asia in terms of greatly reducing the burden, especially on women, of things like weeding and, and such. Uh, but it also can help aggregate uh, uh, input and output markets to foster investment. So I'm really excited. I, I, everybody's heard of Hello Tractor, I think, but Hello Tractor is for, for bigger players. Now, with, with, with more appropriate scaled mechanization, uh, I think we're going to see that penetrate uh, into the smallholder communities where this could be a, a game changer and whereby working as a collective, they're in a better position to both attract market investment, but also respond to market signals. Thoughts? Oh, Rob, you went oh. back on mute. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I just said Vern made the point before on labor, how many things that are prescriptive, like alley cropping, for example, people loved that idea. The amount of work involved is overwhelming. So not that it can't work some places, but we see disadoption often because of the point that the questioner raises. Excellent. Um, for our next question, it's coming from uh, Victor Comorel. Uh, what about investing more in community-based socioeconomic and political resilience? or working on governance at subnational levels. This might help with long-term uh, non-disadoption of basic agronomy at all. So thoughts on investing in the socioeconomic and political resilience activities? Bern? So uh, I'll jump into this one. So, um, you know, in our, in our industry, we work intensively at the local and at the district levels um, engaging with government officials to ensure that we can move coffee. So there's all kinds of issues like just the logistics, the roads during COVID, being um, compliant with all of the sanitary restrictions and requirements that were, were critical to keep people safe and communities safe. Um, local governance is key and having 
inclusive systems for engagement for farmers to be able to communicate with their local officials and for local officials to then communicate to the trade when and how we can move in safely, what we need to do to maintain safety. I think we've learned a lot about local governance in the coffee industry in the last year because we've all been trying to do the absolute best to continue that flow of revenue to local communities who have been producing coffee and, and harvesting and making sure that that wasn't for nothing, right? That we we get them, you know, their, their, their pay at the end of the harvest. And so I think that governance can never be underestimated. Governance systems at the local level and the regional level are critical, you know, subnational level governance, um, communication, and, um, and as the private sector, we're continuously engaging with local officials always to to ensure that we're compliant with regulations and requirements, but also um, pushing forward on on ensuring greater equity and transparency of, of activities across the board. So, I mean, this isn't exactly what I think you were you were asking about with respect to government engagement, because I think obviously the private sector is very interested in governance, but we really look to government bodies to engage. So government to government engagement and support from organizations like the development donor community to support um, governance at a local level. But I think there's different ways and different tools that governments have. We in the private sector are responsive to what exists. Um, we don't try to necessarily create things that aren't there, that aren't organic. And so um, we really look to the government to, um, you know, development donors to support that kind of work at local level, but also, um, we're happy to participate in it. And I think that there's a growing desire, particularly in the coffee industry where economic, environmental, and social sustainability are absolutely front of mind for consumers and for roasting companies, that we really want to figure out how can we do better? How can we support our supply chains? And there's so little connectivity from a roaster in, in Oregon with producers in Guatemala. How can we do a better job of being supportive of local governance and ensuring that um, the sustainability agenda that we all share is affected. So uh, I just wanted to flag that we are deeply supportive and we look to government partners to help us navigate this because it really is the unique domain of government. Excellent. I just add, uh, one point uh, that even if you look at the, the political economy uh, pers from that perspective, um, this is already happening at, in many countries. They have realized that uh, in order to tackle some of these you know, challenges, you have to give more power to local entities. Um, and and you know, this whole devolution, revolution has already started. And uh, uh, you know, I think Ghana, Kenya are, are some of the examples of, of where political Power is, uh, you know, decision-making power is now being devolved to to the, the the lowest administrative levels, and I think this is exactly what uh, Victor is pointing. That what about that? I would say yes. That's a that's a good way of uh, you know a good direction in which we can we should be going to make sure we are uh, addressing these challenges. Okay, thank you. With that, um, we are right at time. So what I want to do is thank our panelists, uh, my wish, Vern and Rob, for joining us today, for presenting their thoughts and for wishing AgriLinks a, a happy 10th birthday. I hope that you continue to engage with us and, you know, join us for our presentations uh, into the next 10 years. Uh, and with that, I also thank our audience. Thank you for joining us today um, for this AgriLink celebration and for joining us for this whole month uh, in celebrating AgriLink's 10 year anniversary. Please check out the you know video testimonials uh, from AgriLink's community, you the community, uh, the other articles that have been posted on retrospectives on 10 years and thinking about what the next 10 years uh, holds. So there's lots of rich content there. Uh, I wanna highlight that next month, we will be having a great collaboration with the CGIR um, for doing a theme month on staple crops, roots, tubers, and bananas. Um, so this will be our first time kind of really focusing on roots, tubers, and bananas as a theme month. Uh, so please check that out. There's a lot of rich content um, that's coming from the CGIR's roots, tubers, and bananas uh, activity. Um, so look forward to that. Um, with that, 
we will send out uh, an email with the recording of this event, uh, with uh, the additional resources, and with a, a Google form to ask that you provide your evaluation, your feedback on this event, um, what your thoughts are on how we can improve it, um, you know, thoughts on what the new platform is like, uh, and you know, what might we change around that engagement to, to improve your experience. So with that, again, Thank you all very much. Thank you for our to our presenters, uh, and thank you for being such a great community to to work with for this past ten years. And I look forward to it continuing um, into the future. Thank you.